Today we are going to be running through the top 10 best builds when it comes to sorcery in Elden Ring. Each of these builds is tested with our personal characters who are at roughly level 300 and on new game plus 6. This was a meticulous study of sorcery schools rather than builds. For those reasons we had to prune builds to maintain that integrity. Some of these schools only had a couple of spells but that didn't necessarily place them low on our list which showed us just how powerful certain sorcery schools were and which ones needed more love. These builds will be based on the following categories out of a score of 40. Agile bosses, large bosses, average bosses, open world performance, PvP, defense, fun, ease, and aesthetic. At number 10, we have this two-faced extraterrestrial, Gravity Greg, inspired by a video created by Fextra Life. This build is centered around having the meteorite staff in your offhand and your highest scaling staff in your main hand, combined with gravity sorcery spells. We are using the Prince of Death staff because our faith and intelligence was where it needed to be. These are the recommended talismans that we used for this build. This build is unique from other builds on this list because it's the only build where you are dealing physical and magic damage with your sorceries. Against bosses, overall, this performed very good. For average bosses, Gravity Greg does very well because you have one spell that deals physical damage, another spell that deals magic damage, and a third spell that basically just wipes them off the face of the earth. For Agile bosses, Gravity Greg performed above average because of the Collapsing Stars spell, which Heat Seeks very quickly. And for large bosses, Gravity Greg does exceptionally well. When you come up against a boss with a large enough hitbox, combined with the Cerulean Hidden tier for unlimited FP, you will just wipe them off the face of the earth, no problem. For those reasons, we're going to give Gravity Greg a 2 out of 3 for Agile bosses, a 3 out of 3 for large bosses, and a 7.5 out of 10 for average bosses. For open world, Gravity Greg was underwhelming. You are mostly limited to your collapsing stars or your rock sling for most situations and the rock sling is very ineffective if there's even the smallest of obstacles in the way and collapsing stars pulls your enemies towards you which is really not ideal for a caster. The only AoE you have with Gravity Greg is the Meteorite of Estelle, which will drain your FP and is ultimately not usable in most situations. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 2 out of 5 for open world. For PvP, this was also pretty underwhelming. Collapsing Stars is actually pretty easy to dodge once you get the hang of it. Your other two weapons are really just not that effective in a PvP scenario. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 2 out of 5 for PvP. When it comes to defense, you are not limited by your armor in any way, not even the helm, technically. However, you are dual wielding staffs, you have no defensive spells, and you cannot block. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 2 out of 5 for defense. This build was kind of meh for me. Overall, for Gravity Greg, I did enjoy this build, but I felt like there were some pieces that were kind of missing. Collapsing Stars is a very powerful spell when used correctly, and for most boss situations, this build is actually pretty reliable. However, for the reasons we listed in open world, as well as PvP scenarios, it doesn't really cut it for me. And when comparing it to the other builds on this list, ultimately, it just fell kind of short. But a final note on Gravity Greg is it's one of the best builds to get early game for any school of magic. The build is also pretty easy to get the hang of. There's not a big learning curve. Ultimately, you're spamming one of three spells. While the gravity spells in Elden Ring are pretty cool to use overall, there's no armor set that goes with this build, and it kind of leaves it feeling a little up in the air as to what the aesthetic actually is. For those reasons, we're going to give this build a one out of three for fun, a two out of three for ease, and a one out of three for aesthetic, which brings Gravity Greg to a 22.5 out of 40. At number nine, we have the Rajer build, inspired by a video created by your average gamer. This build is centered around the Rapier with Carrion Grandeur Ash of War, the Spellblade Armor Set, and the Glintstone Staff. These are the talismans that we recommend for this build. This build is unique from other builds on this list because you are somewhat of a glass cannon. Your carrying grandeur spell hits like a truck, but overall you're going to be taking a lot more damage than any of our other builds. Against bosses, overall this performed okay. The carrying grandeur was able to burst through a lot of average bosses. For agile bosses, this performed poorly. Your lack of range spells and soft squishy armor 
made you very vulnerable in most scenarios and it made it hard for you to get off a large amount of damage. For large bosses, this performed the same. You were pretty limited with your abilities, but if you are able to adapt to this build very well, you're able to get off your carry and grandeur, and the more that you can do that, the easier these bosses are going to be. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 1.5 out of 3 for agile, a 1.5 out of 3 for large, and a 5 out of 10 for average bosses. For open world, this performed good. You had the diversity of utility spells for this build. You had crit damage, melee, fast attack speed, AoE, ranged, and so on. This made the build viable in most open world situations. For PvP, this performed above our expectations. The mix of utility and fast-paced gameplay made it really easy for you to stay on top of most players. The utility also came in handy with most scenarios overall performing well. For this reason, we're giving it a 4.5 out of 5 for PvP. The defense for this build was, as you may have guessed, horrible. You are locked into a squishy armor set, and for these reasons, we gave it a 0 out of 5 for defense. I really enjoy playing this build because you have a broad range of utility spells, and being very good at dodging in this game, I really enjoyed the glass cannon build. It was very exciting and very fulfilling when completing most scenarios. I really enjoyed the diversity of this build, and when I was able to successfully get off a fully buffed carry and grandeur, it was the most satisfying part of this build. This build was very simple to obtain, as most of the spells and abilities you could get very early on in this game without much challenge. As much as the gameplay was very fun, it was a little bit challenging when it came to mastering this. Since you are a glass cannon, it does require you to be very good at the base game itself and know the fights before entering the arena. The aesthetic of this build is incredible. Everything goes together, both spells and armor. For those reasons, I'm going to give this build a 3 out of 3 for fun, a 1 out of 3 for ease, and a 3 out of 3 for aesthetic, bringing the total to 23.5 out of 40. At number 8, we have the Blood Mage build, which is inspired by a video created by The Coop. This build is centered around dual wielding two Staffs of the Guilty combined with the Alberic armor set and uses Aberrant Sorceries. Since the Aberrant Sorceries still deal magic damage, they will actually still be procced by Terra Magica. We just didn't apply it to this build because of aesthetic purposes. These are the recommended talismans for this build, but these talismans would be excellent options as well. Keep in mind, if you're using Briars of Punishment to the fullest extent of its range, Lord of Blood's Exaltation will not proc because you are out of range. And if you use an Arcane Scaling Staff, like the Albernaric Staff, instead of the Staff of Guilty, it will increase the amount of blood buildup. Against all bosses, I was pleasantly surprised with the Blood Mage build. This does a very solid job. You're not really getting heavy hits with your spells, but you are procking bleed from a very comfortable distance. Agile bosses is where this build really kind of falls flat. Because your sorceries are connected to the ground, if you have a boss that's flying around and jumping in the air constantly, it's going to be way harder to hit them with the Briars of Punishment. And for large bosses, the Blood Mage build does above average. For most large bosses, they have a very high health pool, and bleed proc is based off of a percentage for damage. Meaning, as you progress in a new game plus 4, 5, and 6, that percentage of bleed proc will remain just as strong. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 1 out of 3 for agile bosses, a 2 out of 3 for large bosses, and a 7 out of 10 for average bosses. For open world, the Blood Mage did surprisingly well. I didn't expect it to perform this well, but it did. You have Briars of Punishment, which is a very reliable sniper, and you have an AoE spell for close range attacks that you can use in three pumps, which is how long I last. The biggest downside from this build is every time you cast a Briars of Sin or Briars of Punishment, it costs FP and HP, which makes the Ritual Sword Talisman completely useless for this build, and also requires you to just heal randomly way more. For PvP, the Blood Mage build was a pleasant surprise, performing above average. You have a very reliable long range attack combined with a up close and personal AoE spell that have the same exact casting animation, which can sometimes confuse your opponent. For those reasons, we are going to give it a 4 out of 5 for PvP. For defense, this was pretty bad. Aside from the obvious health draw every single time you cast a spell, you have very squishy armor. It's not good at all. The only benefit of this armor set is you are not locked into the pants. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 0.5 out of 5 for defense, 
Overall, I really enjoyed this build way more than I thought I was going to. As we covered in one of our previous videos, we felt like the Blood Mage build was ultimately an unfinished build. However, the aspects of it that are included in the game feel very well thought out. The armor set can be found relatively easily in the capital of Lendale, and one of the spells can be found very easily in Learning the Lakes. However, the other spell you have to go all the way to the snow field to get. And if you want to dual wield staffs of the guilty, you have to loot them from a 2% chance drop in only two different places on the map. The snow field and this very small area in Mount Gelmer. And as far as aesthetic, we feel like this build goes together pretty well. It all looks like it's supposed to go together. And for those reasons, we're going to give it a 2 out of 3 for fun, a 1 out of 3 for ease, and a 3 out of 3 for aesthetic, which brings the Blood Mage build to a 24.5 out of 40. At number 7, we have the Magma build inspired by a video created by Craze Gaming. This build is centered around the Magma Blade and the Gelmir Glintstone Staff combined with Magma spells. The recommended talismans for the Magma build are these. This build is unique from other builds because it exclusively uses fire damage. Against bosses, this build performed above average, mostly because of the diversity of the spells. However, we did note that most bosses have more resistances or immunities to fire than they do on average to magic damage, making this score a little bit lower than we had expected. But there are a few enemies in the game that are extremely vulnerable, like Erdtree avatars, making those fights in particular a breeze. Against Agile bosses, this performed pretty well. You had a very quick Ash of War that you can use in most tight situations, and plenty of ranged options when you had a distance. For large bosses, this performed about average, if not a little under. You didn't really have a heavy hitting spell for most bosses that were large that typically come with a large health pool, making these boss fights last way too long and thus a lot more difficult. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 2.5 out of 3 for Agile, a 1.5 out of 3 for Large, and a 6.5 5 out of 10 for average bosses. For open world, this build performed good. With a diversity of spells and on top of that having a melee weapon with a quick Ash of War that does AoE damage, you were equipped for most situations. This had a large exception when you went to certain locations like the Volcano Manor or against certain dragons where they were resistant if not immune to fire damage. For those reasons, we're giving it a 4 out of 5 for open world. For PvP, this build performed poorly. The Ash of War on your Magma Blade was the exception that made this build very useful. However, most of your spells were very easy to dodge and casting became something that you just didn't really use in PvP. For these reasons, I give it a 2 out of 5 for PvP. The defense of this build was not very good. While you can use whatever armor you decide to go with, you don't really have many abilities that allow you to mitigate damage. Your one exception is your magma that you can use to stagger enemies around you. For those reasons, we give it a 2.5 out of 5 for defense. I really enjoyed this build because of the diversity of spells and the fact that it was just really cool looking to activate all of your abilities. This build was extremely difficult to assemble, however, where you could pick any armor that you want to go with. You don't have to worry about gathering any sets. However, the weapon has a 1% chance to drop off of a select 4 enemies that are actually immune to fire so you can't even farm them with this build. On top of that, the magma staff is something you get off of one enemy, however at least that has an 11% drop chance. This took me over an hour to farm both items and is probably the most challenging part of this build. When it came to playing this build however, it was very easy, a lot of these spells were easy to work with, and your Ash of War came in handy in most other situations. The aesthetic of this build was epic. We did like to mix up different armor sets to enhance that aesthetic, but overall just the magma sorceries and magma blade made this build cool enough as is. The aesthetic really stood out when we used armor sets like the Fire Monk and the Prelate's Armor. Although the Prelate's Armor is probably your best option for this build, it does give you another thing to farm. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 3 out of 3 for fun, a 0 out of 3 for ease, and a 3 out of 3 for aesthetic, bringing the total to a 25 out of 40. At number 6, we have the Death Mage build, inspired by a video by NizarGG. This build is centered around a Prince of Death staff and a melee weapon in the main hand, combined with Death Sorcery. Doesn't that sound cheerful? These are the talismans we recommend using for this build. 
This build is unique from the other builds on this list because it was one of the first thousand subscribers to our YouTube channel. And you should subscribe too, because once we hit a thousand subscribers, we're gonna be holding a secret raffle and one winner will receive a very awesome surprise. Anyway, this build is unique from other builds on this list because the Prince of Death staff scales off of Faith and Intelligence, which is similar to the Mount Gelmir Glintstone staff from the Magma build. However, the Prince of Death staff begins to outperform that staff once your Intelligence and Faith is beyond 50. This is definitely a later game build. Against bosses, this performed pretty solid. For average bosses, it had an answer for most situations that you run into. The Ancient Death Rancor was our main go-to since you can spam it and it deals a significant amount of damage with each blow. The Explosive Ghost Flame wasn't super useful in most boss situations, however it does deal a moderate amount of damage. And the Tibia Summons was pathetic. For agile bosses, the death mage was above average. Again, the ancient death rancor was able to chase down most enemies with ease, dealing a significant amount of damage. However, that's really your only option when it comes to agile bosses. Because the ancient death's rancor is such a fast cast time, it allows you to cast and dodge rapidly when dealing with an agile boss who uses projectiles. And for large bosses, the death mage did about average for the same reasons. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 2 out of 3 for agile bosses, a 1.5 out of 3 for large bosses, and an 8 out of 10 for average bosses. For open world, the death mage performed above average. For the explosive ghost flame spell, it provides a powerful AoE attack, allowing fire to scatter across the floor, which also staggers your enemies. And while your rain cars are chasing down your foes, it allows you to dodge and melee with your main hand weapon. And Tibia Summons is just kinda okay. For those reasons, we're gonna give it a four out of five for open world. For PVP, this did about average. The Ancient Death Rancor makes it very difficult for your enemy to dodge and also kind of just see what's happening in general. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 3 out of 5 for PvP. You are not limited by armor for this build, although we do think it looks coolest with black armor because you're a Prince of Death. And the Ghost Flame Explosion spell, you could argue, is a pretty reasonable defensive spell combined with the flame scattered on the floor. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 2 out of 5 for defense. This build was pretty fun to play with. I enjoyed the variety of spells. The Ancient Death Rancor is a fun thing to use against bosses as well as PvP scenarios. In, and in open world, you feel pretty competent anywhere you go. This build was pretty challenging to assemble overall. You have to kill two of the hardest death right birds in the game just to get your spells. On top of that, the Prince of Death staff is pretty far in the game. It's really inconvenient to get to. But the aesthetic of all of the spells look really cool. For those reasons, we are going to give the Death Mage build a 2 out of 3 for fun, a 1 out of 3 for ease, and a 2 out of 3 for aesthetic, which brings it to a 25.5 out of 40. At number 5, we have the Night Witch build, inspired by a video created by Moxie. This build is centered around dual wielding the Staff of Loss, the Black Knight Assassin armor, and the Invisibility spells. These spells would pair well, but are not buffed by the Staff of Loss. These are the standard recommended talismans for this build. This build is unique from other builds because it is a stealth caster build and the spells are semi-invisible and it doesn't proc your enemies to auto dodge when casting. Against bosses, overall this performed amazingly. For average bosses, this was very easy to cut through the game. Your Night Comet spell is incredibly powerful and hard to dodge and you can cast it pretty quickly. For agile bosses, it did not change too much as as fast as they may move around, it was really easy to land your Night Comet spells and they don't auto dodge when casting. For large bosses, this had a little bit of a struggle. It was still an incredibly powerful spell, but you didn't have any unique buff when it came to a larger health pool. Overall, the strategy remained the same, which is just spamming your Night Comet. For those reasons, we're going to give it a two out of three for agile bosses, a 1.5 out of three for large bosses, and an eight out of 10 for average bosses. For open world, this performed exceptionally well. A fully charged Night Comet, did proc a small AOE. However, if you didn't want to handle a huge group, you could just pull them one by one with your invisibility spells. And for those reasons, we're going to be giving it a four out of five for open world. For PVP, this performed about average. The Night Comet was really the only ability that you can use viably in PVP. And for most players, they knew how to 
dodge it. The ability was strong enough to take out enemies quickly if you could get the jump on them. A stealth build does not take you very far in PvP. For these reasons, we give it a 3 out of 5 for PvP. For defense, this performed pretty poorly. You are limited by your armor as we mentioned before, and the only redeeming quality is that you are stealth most of the time. For these reasons, we're giving it a 2 out of 5 for defense. I really enjoyed this build because of the stealth aspect. Stealth caster is just really cool to play, and it was fun to mix up the gameplay a little bit when replaying the game over. However, this build became very repetitive. This build was rather easy to put together as most of the spells and staff were just simply looted in open world. The armor is looted, but you do have to get all the way to the consecrated snowfield, and the second staff of loss does require a second playthrough. This build was very easy to get a hang of as there is no learning curve to playing this rotation. The aesthetic of this build was very cool, but it did feel a touch incomplete. For those reasons, we're going to give this build a 2 out of 2 for fun, a 2 out of 2 for ease, and a 2 out of 2 for aesthetic, bringing the Night Witch build to a 26.5 out of 40. At number 4, we have the God Tier build, or Azor build, inspired by a video created by Cold Boy. This build is centered around the Azor Staff and the Azor Glintstone Crown, combined with primeval Azor spells. And these are the talismans we recommend using for this build. This build is unique from other builds on this list because of the Comet Azor aspect. It makes most bosses in the game pretty much a trivial situation when used correctly. Against bosses, overall, this performs very well. For most average boss scenarios, you're able to just kind of eliminate them pretty much instantaneously with no problem. Same goes for large bosses, and for agile bosses, this is kind of where you struggle. Because the Comet Azor is pretty much useless if an enemy is able to dodge, you're left just using the Comet which is kind of a hit or miss spell. It is pretty strong, however, spamming Comet over and over isn't always the best strategy for an Agile boss, unlike the Night Comet, which is invisible to most bosses. For those reasons, we are going to give it a 1 out of 3 for Agile bosses, a 3 out of 3 for large bosses, and a 7 out of 10 for average bosses. For open world, the God Tier is a very reliable build to use. We pretty much stray away from Comet Azor for most situations and just use the Glintstone Pebble or the Comet. Glintstone Pebble is nice because it conserves FP, and Comet is nice because it one-shots most open-world enemies. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 5 out of 5 for open-world. When it comes to PvP, God Tier is about average, actually. Similar reasons we listed for open-world, Comet Azor is basically useless in PvP scenarios. On top of that, Glintstone Pebble and Comet are actually pretty easy to dodge in a multiplayer scenario, but if the Comet lands, it's usually one or two hits before your enemy goes down. Therefore, we are going to give it a 3 out of 5 for PvP. When it comes to defense, God Tier is pretty average as well. You're not limited by armor for most of this build, except for the green dildo tape to your face. You have the Jellyfish Shield, which again isn't ideal, and this build isn't really built around using it that much, other than for damage increase. However, a low defense for this build isn't super important because you're one-shotting most things in the game. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 3 out of 5 for defense. I think it's no secret that the God Tier build is really fun to play with. It's basically a meme at this point for Comet Azoring bosses. It's a revenge outlet for a boss that has killed you hundreds of times. It's also a very easy build to put together. All of the pieces of this build can be looted or gained easily during a quest line. The farthest distance you have to travel is Mount Gelmir, and you can actually just loot the item open world without killing a boss. The hardest piece to get is actually the Azores Glintstone Crown, which you have to complete all of Sela's quest line to get. I don't really like the helm. It really only looks cool with the rest of Azores armor, but since you're not required to use it and it's really terrible armor, you're just gonna kinda have this mismatched armor set going on all the time. However, the Comet Azur spell is very cool to use, very fun, I enjoy it. For those reasons, we're gonna give it a two out of three for fun, a three out of three for ease, and a one out of three for aesthetic, which brings the God Tier build to a 28 out of 40. At number 3 we have the Carry Knight build, inspired by a video created by Monk. This build is centered around the Carry Knight armor set, weapon, shield, and the Carry and Glintstone staff combined with the Carry and spells. These are the standard recommended talismans for this build. But these are some good options as well. 
This build is unique from other builds on this list because of its melee feel. Technically, you are still a sorcerer slash caster, but all of this is gonna be close range melee attacks. Average bosses is where it performed the best. For agile bosses, this had the advantage of utilizing mostly quick and up close attacks. So the pressure of something moving around you or pressing on you aggressively wasn't as much of a factor or risk as it was for other casters. However, against large bosses, this really fell short. You didn't really have any heavy hitting abilities, and although you had some good defensives, you really need those offensive, heavy hitting attacks for bosses with large health pools. And for those reasons, we're going to be giving the Carrion Knight a 1.5 out of three for Agile, a zero out of three for large bosses, and a seven out of 10 for average bosses. For open world, this performed exceptionally well. Melee attacks that are quick with AOE, pierce, and other versatile moves, and the fact that you can cut through any armor or blocking made this build a cakewalk when going through the open world. There really wasn't a situation where the Carrion Knight wouldn't perform well in an open world. For these reasons, we're giving it a 5 out of 5 for open world. For PvP, this build performed extremely well. Unlike other caster builds, the Carrion Knight was able to apply a constant melee pressure. Couple that with a well-timed block or spell absorption, and there wasn't really many situations where this build wouldn't thrive. For those reasons, we gave it a 5 out of 5 for PvP. The defense of this build is obviously its strong point. The one downside is that the Carrion Knight armor, although strong at early game, it does diminish very quickly, and we are locked into that since we're following this build. However, the block being high with resistance to melee, holy, and magic, and with an Ash of War that absorbs spells, turning it into an offensive ability, there really wasn't many downsides beyond the limitation of the Carrion Knight armor set itself. For those reasons, we're giving it a 4 out of 5 for defense. I really enjoyed playing this build, and I honestly wasn't expecting it since it seemed to be something that was just really cheesy and basic, but it turned out to be a really well-rounded, flushed out build. Unlike a lot of other builds in this game that only have a couple spells to really fill out the bar. When it came to the gameplay of this build, it was extremely easy to get used to. And on top of that, the build is really easy to put together. Most of these items you can get very early game, if not just looted off of the open world. And the aesthetic of this build is awesome. This is one of the very few builds that are totally flushed out with a full set of armor, weapon, and shield. For those reasons, we're going to be giving it a three out of three for fun, a 2.5 out of three for ease, and a three out of three for aesthetic, bringing the Carrion Knight to a total of 31 out of 40. At number two, we have Ronnie's Dark Fire and Ice Moon build, or Magic Mike, inspired by me, because I made this build. I will give a shout out to V Slayer. This build is centered around dual wielding Carrion Regal Scepters, procking Frostbite, removing that Frostbite with a Fire Cast, and then reprocking the Frost to inflict a large amount of damage in a short amount of time. These are the talismans that I've used for every situation. Against bosses, overall, this performs exceptionally well in almost every situation. This build crushes literally every single average boss that I ran into. Most average bosses actually proc Frostbite within one or two casts of the Dark Moon spell. When you alleviate that with Rykard's Rancor and then cast again, you basically are one or two shotting most of these bosses. For agile bosses, again, this is a very reliable build. The moon is heat seeking and it absorbs incoming magic attacks. On top of that, when you land the dark moon spell, it actually decreases your enemy's magic damage negation, meaning they will be more susceptible to each incoming moon after the first cast. Large bosses is where this had the most trouble, but I don't mean that by far. It's still a very reliable build for most large boss situations save the Elden Beast who is resistant to all magic damage and you don't have any physical damage in this build. For those reasons, we're gonna give it a three out of three for agile bosses, a two out of three for large bosses, and a 10 out of 10 for average bosses. When it comes to the open world, this build performed phenomenally well, mainly because we're using a Duel's Moonblade for most situations. When you're dual wielding staffs and using the Moonblade, 
you're able to alternate which staff uses the Moonblade and it actually allows you to cast even faster than if you were just using one scepter for all of your Moonblade casting. I really couldn't find a negative in the open world when it came to this build and for those reasons we're going to give it a 5 out of 5. For PvP, again, most opponents don't really have an answer when it comes to a Duelist Moonblade. Because you cast the spell and then it also shoots a frost proc outside of the cast, if your enemy dodges backwards, it will still get hit by that residual frost. Their only answer for dodging is to dodge forward into you, which actually leaves them vulnerable for the very next blade that you cast. For those reasons, we give it a 5 out of 5 for PvP. For defense, you're not limited by armor, but I pretty much stuck with the Prelude's armor for every situation. On top of it being one of the best armor pieces in the game, it also kind of adds to a fire and ice kind of look. Other than that, you don't really have very defensive spells necessarily, and you can't block. For those reasons, we're going to give it a 4 out of 5. All of the pieces you need to get for this build are very spread out. The Prelit's Armor, unaltered, is a very low chance drop. And in order to dual wield the Scepters, you need to complete the game twice. Going further, every single spell that I use regularly is either behind a very challenging boss or a weird puzzle. Getting used to the three spells for their specific reasons does take a bit of a learning curve as well. You need to get used to the timing, which situation is best for which spell, and how to properly proc Frostbite and then remove it to proc it again. The aesthetic pretty clearly doesn't really go together as a fully flushed out build. It kind of looks like a six year old just grabbed a bunch of pieces of Elden Ring garb and threw them together to make this. And for those reasons, we're going to give it a three out of three for fun, a zero out of three for ease, and a one out of three for aesthetic, bringing the Magic Mike build to a 32 out of 40. And at number one, we have a Lusat build. We didn't have a video for this as there's lots of guides for builds that include the Stars of Ruin, but there wasn't really Really any that just exclusively used the spells buffed by Lusat's build. We went ahead and used the god tier build, just switching out a couple spells and items. This build is centered around Lusat's helm, staff, and Lusat's primeval sorceries. The spells for this build are Stars of Ruin as they're buffed by 15% from the helm, and the Star Shower and actually Glinstone Stars as well buffed by 10% from the helm. These are the standard recommended talismans for this build. This build is unique from other builds on this list because everything dies extremely fast. Against bosses, overall, this dominated the charts. With the exception of a couple bosses that have resistance to magic, every other boss was completely destroyed by this build. For average bosses, they were basically non-existent as one or two casts after you're fully charged was enough to wipe them out. Against other agile bosses like Millennia and Malekith, for example, that many struggle on, Unlike other builds, this was the easiest way that we could destroy these bosses. And for large bosses, the damage output was enough to really steamroll through any challenge. For those reasons, we're going to be giving it a 3 out of 3 for agile bosses, a 3 out of 3 for large bosses, and a 10 out of 10 for average bosses. For open world, this build performed extremely well, with the only downside really being that you ran out of FP on occasion for, through long gauntlets. Everything that you used in this build would pretty much take out enemies, even in New game 6 with one cast. The Glenstone Stars ability is just a downgraded version of Stars of Ruin, but it still did a really good damage in open world, and the lower FP cost that came with that spell was very useful. Aside from that, you had Stars of Ruin destroying everything in one hit, and the Star Shower for clearing out large mobs in AoE. For those reasons, we gave it a 4 out of 5 for open world. For PvP, it's no secret that the Stars of Ruin spell performs extremely well. When this build is built around just the those spells, it did make it very challenging when you were constantly pressured by melee. The benefit of Stars of Ruin in PvP is that it's extremely hard to dodge. Even if you can time it well, you'll still probably be pegged by one or two of the stars flying through the air. For those reasons, we gave it a 4 out of 5 for PvP. For defense, there wasn't much to tell about this. You were only limited armor-wise by the helmet, which isn't honestly that bad, and you do have the jellyfish shield, With the only pro to this is that everything died before it even got to you. Regardless, the defense was a little weak. For those reasons, we gave it a 3.5 out of 5. I really enjoyed playing this build, and it's honestly my default when I struggle with any boss. It's always fun to destroy everything with such ease, and I haven't really been tired of this build even when I've been running it for months now. 
The spells and items required for this build are pretty straightforward and not too challenging to get. And the gameplay of this is very simple as well. In fact, you really don't need to learn many boss mechanics because everything dies so quickly. The aesthetic of this build is pretty cool. In our opinion, we think that the Lusat Helm is far superior aesthetic wise than the Azur Helm. With the only aesthetic downside being this god awful jellyfish shield. I hate it. For those reasons, we're going to be giving this build a 3 out of 3 for fun, a 2 out of 3 for ease, and a 1.5 out of 3 for aesthetic, bringing the Lusat build to a 34 out of 40 and number one on this list. If you guys have a recommendation for what our next build video should be, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. Thanks for watching.